Professor Lungilenzalaze, um, Executive Dean of the College of Business and Economics. Professor Danielle Nelsanders, our inductee this evening. Professor Fanny Klute, Emeritus Professor, University of Johannesburg and Stellenbosch University. Senior leaders of the university, members of Senate and other academics. Distinguished guests and students, and all who have joined us in this room and online. San Monani, Huyena, good evening. Tobela. It is a great honor and special privilege for me to welcome you to the professorial inaugural lecture of Professor Danielle Nelson. As I do so, I wish to express a, well, a warm welcome to our loved ones, special guests and colleagues. This is indeed a very proud and joyful yet landmark moment for all of you, for Professor Nell Sanders, for us here at UJ for higher education in South Africa and beyond. The inauguration of professors is a public ceremony in which newly appointed professors are inducted into office by the vice chancellor who has kindly asked me to stand in on his behalf this evening. And the professors deliver their inaugural addresses. The ceremony, ladies and gentlemen, has its roots in the medieval university and serves multiple purposes. First, it's an expression of welcome and an entry for new professors joining the circle of colleagues who are already professors. Secondly, it provides a platform for professors to display their expertise in the discipline and showcase their research. In the colonial traditions subscribed to by many universities, assuming the role of the professor refers to the gown and the cap. Once we have listened to the inaugural address the gown denoting the professorship will formally be assumed. Today, we gather to witness Professor Nelson Sanders enter into the illustrious community of scholars at our university, celebrates her contributions in the discipline and ultimately her impact on society. Professors, ladies and gentlemen, provide the university with its identity character, academic legitimacy, and of course, integrity. The inaugural lecture is a rite of passage following the confirmation of the appointment of a person as a professor. And this evening, we will listen to Professor Danielle Nelson as the gown goes to town. And by this, I mean that the power of the inaugural address is when the expertise is showcased beyond the corridors of the university and, of course, reverberates with society. It stands out as a moment of pride for the incumbent, the family, fellow scholars, the university, and ultimately society. In the past, several philosophers and scholars have defined universities using very narrow conceptualizations, for example, the search for truth, for universal knowledge, and even as instruments serving the purpose of the economy or being utilitarian in nature. Through our work and research at UJ, I hope 
that we can break out of these narrow conceptualizations and reflect on the university as contributing to the public good, working towards societal impact. So ladies and gentlemen, what is the role of the intellectual? Edward Said, in one of his articles, defines the role of the intellectual as one who commands a vast knowledge of a specific discipline. One who is rigorous in the analysis of literature. One who views being an intellectual as a vocation and one who functions as a kind of public memory to recall what is forgotten or ignored, to make the connections that are otherwise hidden and to provide alternatives to mistaken policies. It remains then for us as a university with a Pan-African vision to derive our mandate as intellectuals and as professors. And importantly, how do we embrace the role of a professor as a disruptor while continuing to be flagship carriers of our disciplines? So this evening, we'll listen to Professor Danielle Nell Sanders as one step further in the journey of being a professor. This is a journey which does not conclude once the lecture has been given, ladies and gentlemen. However, this lecture does create an opportunity for a self-reflective pause in the journey of the professor. So without further ado, let me invite Professor Lungilenzalaze to introduce Professor Danielle Nell Sanders. I thank you. Thank you, Madam CFO, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. A special greetings to Professor Nell Sanders, her family that is here, friends, colleagues, and students. I would also like to uh, offer a special greetings to those that are observing the proceedings online. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Danielle Nell Sanders. Professor Danielle Nell Sanders is a professor in the School of Public Management, Governance, and Public Policy in the College of Business and Economics at the University of Johannesburg. Her research interests lie within the area of public sector risk management sustainable development, and alternative service delivery. She lectures research methodology at the postgraduate level. Professor Nelson has obtained her doctorate in public management and governance in 2014, and her study was entitled Systematic Risk management and strategic control in public-private partnerships under the supervision of Professor Fanny Clute. Her master's research focused on testing the validity and reliability of current political risk assessment models to accurately focus political risk. Professor Nell Sanders joined the University of Johannesburg as a lecturer in 2013. She was previously employed by the National Research Foundation. In addition, she was also a research advisor at the Sanlam Center for Public Management. In 2012, Professor Nell Sanders completed research fellowship, the Young Scientist Summer Program in the Risk, Policy, and Vulnerability Program 
at the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis in Austria. During the course of her career, Professor Nell Sanders has supervised to completion 174 honors research projects, 15 masters, and four doctoral qualifications. And she has published 43 journal articles. Moreover, she is the chief editor of Administratio Publica, a journal accredited by the Department of Higher Education and Training. Professor Nell Sanders is a National Research Foundation rated researcher. She has received various research grants over the last decade. She has also presented research methodology workshops at selected universities in Africa. Professor Nell Sanders is a member of several professional associations, including the Research Ethics Committee Association of Southern Africa, the Institute for Risk Management South Africa, and the Association of Southern African Schools and Departments of Public Administration and Management. She is an office bearer on the Executive Committee of the Association of Southern African Schools and Departments of Public Administration and Management. Additionally, she has served on the thematic working group for public-private partnerships for the European Evaluation Society. Professor Nell Sanders also served on the Advisory Board of Directors Association. Ladies and gentlemen, let's please put our hands together and welcome Professor Nell Sanders. Good evening. Thank you, Ms. Nawazi Mamorari, Professor Lungile and Salazi for officiating. Thank you to the University of Johannesburg for this inauguration and for recognizing my scholarship. Please allow me to first provide some background about who I am and where I come from. I believe this is important because it influences my worldview as an academic. I grew up in a children's home, in a Jacaranda children's home, and I made a conscious decision from a young age I would not let my circumstances and my environment define who I would become. The hardest part of coming from a broken home is finding the courage and strength to believe in yourself because no one can do that for you. I knew from a young age that the only means to rise above my circumstances would be through education. I'm grateful for my time in a children's home because I'm living proof of the difference that philanthropy can make in an individual's life. My passion for education dates back to my high school days during the children's home, my time in a children's home. I frequently mentored um, children and individuals and primary school and high school, and later on at university I was also a tutor. I profoundly believe that at the end of the day everything comes down to being human and to, being, to people, the journeys we live and how they intersect with each other, and the differences it makes in each other's lives. Every action you take will reflect in someone else's decision, someone else's future, someone else's life, good and bad. This is the Brigden Principle. One of my favorite novelists, Guinea Dye, coined the Brigden Principle and it's Gaelic for breeding, breeding and weaving, yes. Um, and according to Guinea Dye, open quote, every life that has been lived until today is part of a woven braid of life. The Brigden Principle also finds resonance in the Newton's third law of motion, which means that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. And this is also true for government decision making. All uh, decisions have an impact on society. I feel it's necessary for my students to understand 
that they hold the power of future public servants to mold and shape better decisions for society. This is precisely why the Brecton Principle is also close to my heart. Uh, being an academic is not simply a job. It is a passion and it is an opportunity to make a positive contribution to society. I will now share some insights on my, based on my past, current and future research. My research is multidisciplinary in nature at the intersection of public governance, risk management, sustainable development and environmental governance. My research outputs have centered around developing my niche areas, which is risk management and sustainable development. My work has focused on risk management in alternative service delivery and particularly within the context of the fourth and the fifth industrial revolution. In essence, my research aimed to understand public sector risk and its impact on important policy programs via alternative service delivery. My current research considers wicked risks and the role that alternative service delivery play in addressing wicked problems. My research has concluded that traditional hierarchical methods of bureaucratic governance are no longer sufficient to address wicked risks. Wicked problems are inherently complex. They have countless root causes connected to numerous social contexts, stakeholders, and actors, as well as exhibiting unpredictable behaviors and consequences. Wicked problems are considered a blight because they inflict immense harm upon society. Rittle and Weber in 1973, in their work titled Dilemmas, in a general theory of planning, identified 10 defining characteristics, which is still continues to guide our understanding of wicked problems. And they include, namely, there's no definitive formulation of a wicked problem, there's no stopping rule of a wicked problem, solutions to wicked problems are good, bad, rather than true, false, there is no immediate or ultimate test to a solution to a wicked problem. Every solution to a wicked problem is one shot and cannot be undone. Wicked problems do not have an exhaustive set of solu potential solutions. Every problem is unique. Every problem is the symptom of another problem. The existence of discrepancy in a wicked problem can be explained in numerous ways and the policy planner has no right to be wrong. Wicked problems are linked to institutional complexity, social diversity, and scientific uncertainty. Wicked problems are complex and highly uncertain in na nature. In practice, governments are more equipped to deal with problems that are relatively routine and standardized. However, they are less equipped to deal with problems that are non-linear, non-routine, and non-standardized, which are typically considered wicked problems. Wicked problems pose a number of risks for society, some of which, if left unmanaged, can lead to more severe forms of risks, namely existential and systemic risk. Systemic risk is the overall collapse of a system, whereas the extreme and existential risk is a result of anthropogenic risk, which is caused by humans and can lead to global, global catastrophe. Like, for instance, environmental degradation, climate change, and disruptive technologies such as artificial intelligence. These risks are overlapping, unstructured, and multifaceted in nature, which I term in my research wicked risks. In my research, I characterize these wicked risks as wild and rebellious. The wild nature is based on the uncontrollable and unrestrained way in which these risks manifest. Hence the title of my inaugural address is to mitigate wicked risk because it's not possible to totally eradicate these risks. And to mitigate a risk means to reduce the severity of its impact. Furthermore, they are rebellious due to the resistance to an established government. Conventional government governance is not sufficient 
to mitigate these risks, and government alone does not possess the capacity to mitigate these risks. For this reason, I propose in my research that alternative service delivery approaches and mechanisms should be incorporated, and that multiple actors should be included in response to wicked risks. Notably, the concept of wicked problems is still rarely applied in Africa today. And it, when it is, it's done by academics from Western or Anglophone backgrounds. My research considers wicked risks in the African context. My research has specifically focused on addressing the multifaceted risks faced by society, by society within the framework of sustainable development goals. And specifically, I have looked at wicked risks in the context of sustainable development by doing detailed case studies pertaining to the following areas of sustainable development goals. Firstly, goal four, which focused on ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and to promote lifelong learning. Uh, with regards to this um, goal, I have focused on education within the fourth industrial revolution Secondly, goal five, focus on achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls. My research in this regard has focused on gender mainstreaming in the energy sector in South Africa. Goal number seven, focus on ensuring affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all. And I've done a number of case stu studies on uh, public-private partnerships and independent power production in the energy sector in South Africa. Goal number eight, aim to promote inclusive economic growth, full productive employment and decent work. Regarding this goal, I have done case studies on disruptive technology and innovation for good governance and economic growth in South Africa. Goal number nine, aim to build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation, regards to this goal, I have done research on infrastructure and inf innovation through public-private partnerships. And lastly, goal 17, focus on strengthening the means of implementation and revitalizing the global partnerships for implementation of the sustainable development goals. And with regards to this goal, I have focused on multi-stakeholder partnerships, which is a means to also achieve all the sustainable development goals. Risk management is an integral component of ensuring sustainable development in society. Risk analysis provides a mechanism to identify wicked risks. By incorporating risk analysis and risk management into policy planning, government can achieve better planning, strategizing, and towards achieving the sustainable development goals. Risk originates from uncertainty in everyday life. Entailing decisions whether to make certain dis act take certain actions. And the term risk arose from the Italian word risicari, which means to dare. To dare means to take up the courage, which implies a positive aspect. And the Chinese ideogram for risk combines two symbols, which is danger and opportunity. Means the upside of risk is opportunity and the downside is loss. This is a central theme in my research. I consider how governments can become more efficient by taking risks and capitalizing on the opportunities presented in investing in alternative service delivery. There is a need for government to make more sizable investments in mitigating wicked risks. Risk is a nominal concept and it's difficult to operationalize it needs dimensional and contextual clarification. For example, financial, country, political, social, risk, to name a few. Some consider risk from an economic, financial, social, or philosophical view. My research focuses on multiple disciplines and the implications for policy making, going beyond purely technical risk. I approach risk analysis and management through a general systems theory perspective. General systems theory is well suited to, an, to analyze the risk landscape. 
Systems theory provides a framework to analyze holes, interdependence, and complexity, which is the very nature of wicked risks. I use systems theory to analyze non-traditional service delivery systems and approaches to address complex public service challenges. Alternative service delivery refers to methods other than conventional hierarchical bureaucracy for delivery of public services. The goal of alternative service delivery is to draw attention to innovative alternatives. Alternative service delivery represents government reforms to improve efficiency, innovation, and performance. Examples of alternative service delivery includes amongst public-private partnerships, service, shared services, and IT modernization, electronic service delivery, contracting out, to name a few. Prior to the 1990s, state-led service provision, which was referred to the age of big government. With the spread, however, of globalization during the 1980s and 1990s, sovereign nation states are becoming more and more irrelevant, being replaced by multilateral institutions and global governance organs. This has led to the phenomena called the hollowing out of the state, with government reform characterized by privatization, public-private partnerships, limited public sector intervention, and other alternative service delivery mechanisms, thus involving alternative actors and approaches such as non-governmental organizations, the community, and business in the process of governing. These reforms have made, have made way for new doctrines, focusing on value for money, market-based governance, new public management, network and collaborative governance. This marked a shift from government to governance. My research recommends combining three alternative service delivery approaches, namely partnering, digital governance, and service delivery innovation. A systemic improvement in govern governance reform is necessary to mitigate wicked risks, which should be guided by risk-informed decision-making. Risk-informed decision-making goes beyond purely quantitative risk assessment. Only one part of decision-making involves quantitative results of risk analysis. Other factors, including societal preferences, political concerns, and financial limitations should also be taken into account. Within the realm of alternative service delivery options, it's imperative to incorporate three design principles, namely robustness, resilience, and adaptivity, which serves as the cornerstones in mitigating complexity and uncertainty. Robustness will ensure that governments not crumble during duress and shocks. This necessitates robust governance, which should be designed to be agile and flexible to mitigate risk during turbulent times. Robust governance is characterized by competent public administration, analytical ability, collaborative ability, organizational management, and an aptitude for contingency planning. The single most crucial aspect to mitigate wicked risks is digital governance. Digital governance involves the use of information, communication technologies, and cutting-edge analytical tools to enhance performance of public institutions and services. Governments can use technology, assisted digital governance, as a tactic to meet citizen participation, citizen expectations, to cut expenses, and accomplish economic recovery goals. Digital governance is becoming more and more important in the transition from the fourth to the fifth industrial revolution. The fifth industrial revolution is also commonly referred to as the super smart society and aims to bridge the gap between humans and technology. Ongoing digital transformation is resulting in automated forms of governance and policy design, sometimes replacing or substituting analog ones. In this context, the term analog governance describes situations in which 
bureaucratic incentives, bilateral task coordination, actor-based relational trust, and centralized control systems predominate. On the other hand, automated government means algorithmic, algorithmic systems trust, omnilateral coordination, automatic and cybernetic incentives, and decentralized control are the main pillars of governance. Given these two extremes, an augmented government approach, where actors and algorithms interact, is an intermediary mode. Distributed control and trust, programmatic incentive systems, and multilateral coordination are all components of augmented governance. An augmented governance approach is most suitable for a super smart society because it focuses on bridging the gap between humans and technology. Several design principles should guide the design of policies for digital governance. Firstly, basic services should be delivered for free in offering online services, expensive offline channels and resources are displaced, contributing less to government expenditure and tax savings. Secondly, already existing digital information should be used by ensuring that open data, big data, real-time data and analytical data is used efficiently. Furthermore, governments should execute tasks once by constructing many different products from one baseline component and modules should be written with multiple applica applications across government. In addition, scalable services should be grown in the face of competition by introducing incremental innovation. And lastly, an isocratic government should be established where people and, or citizens are empowered to solve their own problems. In essence, digital technology can allow for co-production and co-creation of a great magnitude. Partnerships and co-governance mechanisms can provide pragmatic solutions for addressing wicked policy issues. Governments opt for public-private partnerships when projects are complex, financially uh, difficult to execute, and polit politically contentious. Based on my past research, I recommend three types of partnerships for addressing wicked problems, namely public-private partnerships, multi-stakeholder partnerships, and hybrid public-private partnerships. Public-private partnerships are a form of network governance and have been used since the 1980s to increase government efficiency. The public-private partnership label was originally conceived in the new public management era pre-1990, however, the past, ten, the past decade, um, the public-private partnerships have broke away from the new public management agenda to join the new public governance agenda. New public governance focus on achieving mutual goals in an integrative manner to address problems through collaborative relationships. Multi-stakeholder partnerships is a subset of transnational partnerships operating in the field of sustainable development and is mostly voluntary in nature. And within the co context of finite resources and ever-changing conditions, multi-stakeholder partnerships offer strategic advantages for collaboratively creating public value. Multi-stakeholder partnerships are important for co-creation and enhancing public value. My research on hybrid public-private partnerships assessed independent power production as a variant model for public-private partnerships. This research is unique as the concept of hybridity and hybrid public-private partnerships is an unexplored area in public sector management. In my research, I define hybrid public-private partnerships as collaboration between state-owned enterprises, government, and business. Hybrid public-private partnerships represent an innovative approach to public-private partnerships for energy partnerships and serves the public, public interest and is crucial for the country's energy transition. My findings 
of my research I conducted on the allocation of risk in public-private partnerships in the information communication technology sector suggests that digital technologies such as blockchain and smart contracting can enhance efficiency of partnerships. This research is also novel and fills a gap in the body of knowledge because there has not been research done on public-private partnerships in information communication technology. While public-private partnerships have traditionally focused on addressing hard services, there is potential for public-private partnerships to also address soft service delivery. Through the use of smart contracts, smart partnering, smart partnering can be facilitated, improving the efficiency of public-private partnerships and potentially leading to efficient risk allocation, automated contract administration, and clear agreements. A number of building blocks should guide service delivery innovation to address some of the primary issues that define government bureaucracies and frequently impede the advancement of relationships with public services. Innovation needs the correct institutional basis. Another aspect is also to strengthen capacity at all spheres and levels of government. Government should provide a more responsive, seamless whole of government service. And re-engineering is necessary to provide in, to ensure seamless services. Re-engineering is the process of drastically rethinking and rearranging business processes in order to achieve noticeably higher performance levels. Total quality management can contribute to a whole of government service where the focus is on customer satisfaction. Benchmarking can ensure a responsive government service. Identifying, modifying, and putting into practice best practices are all part of benchmarking. Governments must get past the antiquated departmental silos in place to oversee the public sector. Involving citizens is key. Leadership in the areas of governance, human resources, risk management, legal authority, policy and programs, and quality management is necessary for service delivery innovation. Findings from our research with co-author Al Masalela indicate that an open governance approach has proven successful to encourage service delivery innovation and co-creation. Open governance focuses on establishing a culture of governance based on innovation and sustainable public policies and practices inspired by principles such as transparency, accountability, and participa participation, which fosters democracy and inclusive growth. So I ask the question, where is South Africa in this picture? So the government cannot address system, cannot address wicked risk amongst System-wide corruption, weakened state capacity, failure to deliver basic services, economic decline, and in economic inequality. In order to mitigate wicked risk and meet the sustainable development goals, South Africa has to achieve more inclusive and sustainable outcomes. Drastic efforts are needed in South Africa to address system-wide challenges presented by wicked risks to develop more resilient systems. Resilience is the ability of individuals and governments to endure during different shocks and strains. Systems should be built with resilience so they can adjust, deal with change, and eventually thrive. My forthcoming research will focus on the role of public-private partnerships in environmental governance. This research will produce a number of outputs the first being a book chapter in a book titled Handbook of Public Management in Africa. This research focuses on lessons learned from public-private partnerships in environmental governance and specifically in the energy sector in South Africa. The research will identify best practices for developing countries for employing partnerships to address environmental governance problems. In conclusion, my research has focused on wicked risks presented in problems with wicked features, such as energy policy, disruptive technology, environmental governance, and innovation. 
all of which are necessary for the realization of sustainable development. Because there are no immediate solutions to addressing wicked risks, these risks can easily spin out of control and create turbulence. I apply systems theory to analyze effective alternative service delivery responses to wicked risks. My research suggests that robust governance responses are needed to mitigate wicked risks and that alternative service delivery approaches presents robust features such as flexibility, agility, and adaptability, and is also decentralized in nature, rather than simply relying on bureaucratic governance responses. Inputs into the system include digital governance or government, partnerships, service delivery innovation. Policy, structural, and functional variables are processed within the context of a risk-informed decision-making context. And risk-informed decision-making should be placed at the center of the reform agenda. The outputs in the system would be to address the sustainable development goal targets, and the outcomes would lead to a super smart and sustainable society. I owe a great deal of gratitude to some remarkable individuals who have guided me on my academic journey. Professors Dion Haldenhuis, Professor Fanny Kluter, Professor Cristal Uriakombi, your incredible mentorship has been invaluable and I'm deeply grateful for your wisdom and mentorship throughout the years. Please allow me to express gratitude to my postgraduate students you have played a pivotal role in shaping my academic career, and I am immensely grateful for growing and learning alongside you. You are one of the main reasons why I'm an academic, and to see you succeed is what makes my work meaningful and fulfilling. Sincere thanks to my colleagues in the School of Public Management, Governance, and Public Policy for your unwavering support. It has been a pleasure working alongside you and on a personal note, with immense gratitude in my heart, I thank all my friends and family who are present today for being the pillars of strength and joy in my life. In particular, my husband, Adrian Sanders, for being my rock, and my toddler, Mila, and my baby, Alex, for your love and teaching me patience during many sleepless nights. And also thank you to Fani, Kulit, Zander, Zaskia, Kotze for your wisdom and love. I would also like to thank Cecile de Priya, Marty Berger, Ida Meyer, and Tinas Arvia, who worked at the Jacaranda Children's Home. Thank you for believing and investing in me. Lastly, thank you to my dearest friends who are here in person today, Dr. Letitia Smits, Ms. Aurel Reynor Nimak. Um, Vincent Jones for standing by me through thick and thin. To all those of you who have joined today, whether in person or online, your presence is deeply appreciated. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen and uh, colleagues, I've been requested to make a few comments uh, on the uh, inaugural lecture that uh, Danielle has just given to us. Um, I've been informed very strictly that uh, I should not talk for much longer than seven minutes. In fact, that's the absolute maximum. <laughs> Now, I'll try my best for, for a lecturer uh, who uh, feels that uh, he or she has a lot of information to convey to students. It's, it's a bit difficult, but, but uh, let's, let's see. I, I don't uh, intend to really duplicate uh, the, the lecture that uh, Daniel has given us uh, this evening. 
What I would like to do is just to informally um, sketch a little bit more details about the context that led to her decision to focus on um, uh, these wicked problems and wicked risks and why it's so important these days. She did mention, she talked about the complexity of society these days and um, that's, that's obviously true and it, it, it's very accurate. But uh, it, it, in terms of, of governmental processes, which, which are the, the frameworks within which she, she's um, undertaking her studies, uh, I just want to unpack that uh, a little bit more. No business or NGO uh, or individual uh, probably faces the type of complexity that government agencies face in the work that they do. Um, these days, uh, governments are still supposed, as in the past, to uh, provide services to people, facilities to people, to empower people, uh, to, to try to enable not only uh, the, the people in their societies, but uh, all the other vulnerable segments of society, including nature, to develop to, to its full potential. And this is where the problem comes in, because government faces, especially these days, with technology that uh, is so disruptive, with good education in every society that, um, um, that allows people to, to critically seek their own salvation in a certain sense and their own development. Um, it, it makes it uh, very difficult for government to, to try to provide um, services that uh, satisfy the competing demands of people. There are more and more people. There are billions at the moment. Um, the, the good education that we found uh, in, in modern society allows for, for increasing demands on government agencies to provide not only more and more services and facilities, but also higher and higher quality and standards of services. Um, the competing demands on governments, um, you, you can illustrate by, by a, a linear line going upwards, the resources available to governments these days also grow from year to year, but at a much slower level. So, so the, the, the gap between the demands and expectations on the one hand and the resources of states and other governmental agencies to comply with those demands um, just becomes more and more impossible. And this is where the risk comes in. No government these days is really in full control of its society, of its resources, of its goals that it, 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 it tries to, to um, uh, achieve. Um, just think about the internet and the fact that uh, money can be, can be uh, trans, uh, you know, transported uh, in, in, in instant seconds across the whole world. Therefore, the, the complex decisions governments have to take must be done very carefully. And mistakes can come in, as David Cameron found when, when he held uh, a referendum on Brexit. Uh, so, all that I've tried to do in the minute or so at my disposal still to conclude is that this context emphasizes the critical importance of focusing on taking the right decisions and ensuring that those decisions are feasible and affordable and sustainable. And this is where the, the risk issue comes in. So I, I want to congratulate uh, uh, Danielle.
for um, the cutting edge summary that she has uh, provided to us here. Uh, it is um, in terms of my own experiences and exposure to these issues, um, uh, internationally competitive. Uh, her activities are internationally competitive as uh, is apparent from, from her uh, uh, CV that was summarized here this afternoon. And um, her scholarly focus is therefore what I regard as theoretically valid. Uh, it's methodologically sound, it's strategically critical, it's societally relevant and appropriate, and it's imperative to improve sustainable development impacts of public sector interventions. And um, I think she fully deserves her full appointment as, as professor. Um, she's also an excellent role model for for people to overcome obstacles in life through dedication and hard work, as we've seen. Congratulations, Tanya. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause for <laughs> Professor Danielle Nell Sanders. Congratulations, Danielle. Um, earlier today, um, Professor Nzalaz and I attended a conference hosted by the university on um, risks facing higher education. Um, one of the speakers at the conference um, ventured that one of the single most risks that we're facing currently is the complexity of our risks. So I can't think of a better way to have ended today than your very insightful um, lecture. As uh, Professor Mbedi kept saying, the leaders that are going to change this world are going to come from the University of Johannesburg. Yes. <laughs> so, so congratulations once again on your great work. Um, and on behalf of the university, I want to wish you all of the best in your future studies and the great work that you're doing. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much um, for being with us this evening. Um, we do have um, refreshments that will be served to your right um, to continue to celebrate Professor Nelson. Thank you very much. The University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined.